Sack service chiefs or lose 2023 elections, Northern Elders say to APC. And Governor Akeridolu reads riot acts to herders in Ondo State. The presidency intervenes. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mariana Kong. Northern elders have stated that the situation in the northern region is not getting any better, confirming that the region is still under siege from Boko Haram terrorism, banditry, kidnapping and other forms of criminality. They have threatened to mobilize Nigerians from other parts of the country against the ruling All Progressive Congress, APC, in the 2023 general elections if their demands from the administration to stop the killings in their region is ignored. And joining us to discuss this matter, we have Ife Wanago. He is a security expert joining us live from Port Hackett. And also we have Musa Idris. He's the chairman of the People's Alliance Party and he's joining us live from Kaduna. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Good Thanks for having me, Maria. Great. I'm going to start with Ife, uh, Ife, because you are a security analyst and you've worked with um, the security agencies here in Nigeria before. I want to start by asking, uh, why has the issue of insecurity and restoring peace uh, in the Northeast lingered so much that, you know, it's not been addressed for far too long? Well, a lot of people like to cite... Um a litany of reasons, a myriad of um, reasons. Some would want to say there are excuses, if you like. Uh, some would want to say it's an evolving scenario. Um, but there is no single solution, no single response to the reason we have a protracted security situation. Some would rather believe that it's a situation where, um, over time, um, there's been in, uh, inactivity from the political angle, there's been no proper gauging of the scenario and a response by the political class. Others would want to say that it's an evolving scenario and that terrorism is a concept that is ubiquitous. It's not something you handle once and for all and goes away. But others would also believe that that is begging the issue that the Boko Haram matter and banditry in the Northeast should have been dealt decisively if proper responses have been put in place. And others would like to say there are cultural issues, socioeconomic issues, uh, provided you have um, poverty in the land, you have illiteracy, you know, insecurity is bound to follow until you tackle issues of poverty that affect citizenry in parts of the country, you cannot have um, a proper and a secure society. So from whatever perspective you look at it, it's not a silver bullet scenario. There's no one size fits all. There are a myriad of explanations that would determine or that would um, seek to explain the situation we have today. Um, you, you cannot definitively um, put a pin to it and say this is the singular reason why insecurity seems to be rife and continues to be intractable in the north. That, that is well understood, but why don't you think that, or maybe do you think that if there were certain things that were done on time and strategically, maybe the situation wouldn't have gone this bad? Could there have been things that the government could have done security-wise in terms of um, re-strategizing? Could that have maybe termed or stemmed the situation um, from what it is today? No, make no mistake. I'm of the position that um, what we have is not something that even should be intractable. I believe that uh, the Nigerian security apparatus, the Nigerian society, our security agencies put together have the requisite um, force, the requisite capacity to tackle the entire security situation we have on hand. What I find to understand is the um, political will, you know, on the part of the political class, um, because you find that we've had Boko Haram for years now, we've had banditry, we've had um, all kinds, you know, from, they call it banditry, they call it Boko Haram, they call it headsmen, you know, depending on the part of the North they operate. Um, but this is not something that is beyond the Nigerian um, security um, apparatus. I, I, I doubt that. We have the capacity in the Nigerian military and the other security agencies, the police and the DSS, the civil defense, working together 
they can definitely put a stop to this or reduce it to the barest minimum. While we still have it ravaging today, I think it, it may be a matter of strategy, a matter of tactics, a matter of breathing new life, which brings us to the uh, matter of the day. Why is not another forum apprehensive? Why are they complaining? Mm. You know, why are they trying to hold the APC to account in 2023 on account of the continuous um, bloodshed and carnage in parts of the country? Mm. You know, for me, this is not something that should hold us to ransom. I believe that we have underlying issues that need to be trashed. And until we trash them definitively... But who is supposed to trash these underlining issues? As much as, as much as I know that you're, being, you're trying to be apolitical in this conversation, there are underlining issues that need to be thrashed. May I remind you that the Buhari administration campaigned on the heels of fighting insecurity. In fact, they put the Jonathan administration's feet to fire, making sure that the issue of insecurity was a daily thing on our national dailies. It was in the news until they came into power. So should the Norsen elders not be holding their feet to the fire right now? And, and uh, I mean, underlining issues definitely is part of what they promised to address. Why haven't they? Absolutely. I, I'm not going to speak on, on behalf of them. I think Nigerian, being somebody, not just being someone who's in the security, who is a security practitioner in the security environment. As a Nigerian, everybody has a right to hold the feet of the government to the fire of accountability as far as security is concerned. We've had less deal than was promised the Nigerian electorate. And every Nigerian who is a citizen must look to the government and call them to stop the carnage. You see, like you said, and rightly so, the Jonathan government was blamed for insecurity. And on the tripod of insecurity, economy, and corruption, the Buhari government came into office. Um, very little has been done as far as I'm concerned. Initially, there seemed to be some headway. But over time, you know, people have complained. That's why you see people are talking about um, change of guard, you know, service chief that remain in office for too long, even beyond their mandatory years of service, you know, and period of, of, of service, mm -hmm. you know, retirement age and what have you. And we still have the same scenario. You know, there have been the issue of the president um, okay. responding that he's loyal to his service chiefs. Uh, what we think should have been the other way, and what we think should be uh, based on performance and competence. You don't, you don't we, 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 we will come you back to this issue. I'm going to come back with this question to you, but let me go to Mr. Musa Idris now. Uh, Mr. Idris, in December 2020, the 16th of December 2020, um, the National Coalition of Interface Group of Nigeria decried Mr. President's silence on rejigging um, the nation's security architecture um, to face the insecurity that the country uh, had been facing. Um, the Senate in that same uh, 2020 asked that Mr. President, in fact, for the upteenth time, because they had been asking Mr. President to change his service chiefs, they asked for the upteenth time that he sacks his service chiefs because they don't seem to be delivering. Now, Spokesperson of the Northern Elders Forum asked the president to resign because of the state of insecurity in the country. But all of these calls seem to be falling on deaf ears. Why, is my question, why has Mr. President failed to listen to these calls from the people in that region? Because they seem to be the ones who feel this pinch much more than those of us who are on this other side of the Niger. Yeah, uh, that seems to be the one million naira question. You know, why has Mr. President uh, not taken the decision to sack the service chiefs? I want to add that uh, you also recall that uh, the National Assembly, specifically the Senate, had had about four resolutions, you know, asking the president to sack the service chiefs. It was immediately after that resolution that one member stood up to say, uh, and that was immediately after the killings in Awino, where uh, you know, uh, about 65 you know, farmers were, were slaughtered, yes. for specifically 43, that is the number they are, they, are, they are throwing around. So what I'm trying to say is that if that is the case, the National Assembly, for which of course is the people representatives, are saying that this is what people are saying. And they reached resolutions that the president should sack service chiefs. But the president had come out succinctly, exact, to say that he is not going to sack the service chiefs because he feels they are doing better. So what I have been saying over time is that since this is the, I mean, the, the conviction of the president and his cabinet that they are not, sorry, that is not my name, it's Idris. 
that name is not Adagi, it's Idris. Go ahead, Idris. we know. I D R I S. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly, better. So you see, so I, I, I believe that uh, you see the, the National Assembly have tried their best representing the people, saying exactly, you know, what the people are saying, that they want the president to start the savage, reject his uh, uh, security architecture, and then add new bites into the entire structure. Mm -hmm. So those that uh, will begin to see the difference there. But unfortunately, the man has said no. So that is why the Northern elders now came out to say, well, they are representing the people, and of course, we are from the, they are from the North, and then most of these incessant killings are happening especially in the north, especially the northwest, and, uh, and uh, so this were all the cries, and then it has fallen on the death of the president. So, what I have keep on saying is that if the president has said no, and then there had been a couple of, uh, you know, pockets of demonstration here and there, people actually saying that, no, enough is enough, we had demonstration. In fact, I have been part of, you know, people had called for Certain, you know, demonstration, I mean, a peaceful march to say, we want this thing to, 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 to be over. Unfortunately, these are falling in deaf ears. But the president had insisted he believes his savage chiefs are going to, you know, do, do the needful by, 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 by getting rid of the, the, the insecurity in the country. So far, that has not happened. So that is the, the one million other questions that we are seeing. We don't know the president's secret. We don't know what he has seen. I mean, because he knows better than us. We don't know where he insists they have to bend. I hear... Uh, is it a burning go by the dog the guy at the other end uh, saying that, uh, of course, uh, most people have actually uh, been saying that uh, since it is the, the, the most of the heat is coming from the north, we know where the this 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 the the the, the shield pinches. Well, so so be it, but um, it, it, it's, it's quite unfortunate. We are feeling so bad. Uh, lastly, I think there was a member who spoke last week that uh. Uh, most of you know him, who was saying that, uh, what is this COVID stuff that government is paying more attention in COVID compared to what's happening in the Northwest? That a lot of persons have died in the Northwest, much, much larger than, more than the, 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 the people that have died from COVID. And government had applied us, I mean, spent more money recently on COVID, uh, you know, coronavirus, more than actually uh, the, their attention on the paid on the on the insecurity mm -hmm. specifically in the northwest and in the northeast mm -hmm. so these are the problems so this is already in the political domain people are beginning to be worried as to why are we not getting changes but i must tell you that we are beginning to get a reprieve uh, just yesterday or rather about two three days ago and then yesterday uh, there is an islamic cleric one uh, dr uh, hamad gumi who actually went some of these uh, gamma gear of course you must have seen it in the social mm -hmm. media he went to Gamma Regida, visited the, 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 the insurgents, and they, they have a truce that are going to down arm and, and all of that. I think that thing is working. So we will want to see in the couple, next couple of days and see how they will be able to, you know, stop this insecurity. But should that be, that, the, that, that, should that that be the job of a cleric? The, the cleric did not take an oath of office to protect lives and property. The cleric did not promise us that we were going to get respite from insecurity, which has now metamorphosed into banditry and kidnappings and cattle rustling. The cleric did not take an oath, did he? Of course, what he's doing no, he's, is noble. No, no. But, but why should that responsibility no, fall the on the did. shoulders no. of a cleric? No, you, I want you to understand that the cleric was not speaking. No, he was not speaking on behalf of government. I want of, you Obviously, to know he that. wasn't, but I'm the, saying... Dr. Hamad Gumi... Dr. Hamad Gumi was actually talking on behalf of the ulama, you know, those who uh, are concerned about what is happening. And he made these two visits. One he did to a community in Jere, you know, local government, and then another one he did in a, a community again in Benengwari. These are very thick forests. These are where the bandits actually reside. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, he was he visited and they agreed. They, they accepted him and then they agreed. And the only thing they said was that they would die arm, but government should, for God's sake, take care of their social basic amenities. Government exactly. should be able to empower them. And government that's, should be able to provide, that's, you know, that's the reason for water my and schools. And all they need, you know, to take care of them so that they can leave this insecurity. Yeah, Mr. Musa, and that, 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 that is, is the reason why I asked that and question that, initially. I, I was asking why, because if this person, is his one man, is able to get as far as he did, why is it taking the government so long to be able to at least do what he has done? 
Because you're saying that exactly. because of what he's done, you're going to get some form of respite or you're expecting some form of respite. How come the government is unable to do that when one man is able to accomplish it and he has no arms, he has no um, you know, security experience? Exactly. That is the, that is the one million dollar question I asked you. This is exactly the problem people are asking. I told you he made two visits. The one, the one he, he did yesterday, you know, that was where they, 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 they swore an oath with the, with the, with the bandits that they are going to actually done their, their, their arms. But there was, the, there was a caveat to that. You know, they said only where the government is able to provide their social basic amenities. But I want to add here that the cleric himself have been able to, you know, through his own efforts, through his own, you know, followers, they've been able to. Oh, I think we lost um, Mr. Idris there. Let's go back to Efe. Efe, um, in 2016, um, 2,500 people died from, um, as a result of herders and farmers clashing. Um, and then for Boko Haram, in the first six months of 2020, more than 1,100 people um, also died from Boko Haram's um, you know, insurgents. Hundreds of schoolboys were kidnapped. We remember that one. It's still fresh in our memories. People were killed on their rice farms. And all of this happened in 2020. Could all of these things that have happened lined up back to back not have given the presidency, his security chiefs, a sense of urgency to realize that there needs to be a change of strategy? Because I'm wondering if you do the same thing over and over again, hoping for... Um, a, a different kind of reaction, that has to be madness, isn't it? Well, absolutely, Mary. I'm, you uh, see... Uh, by, I'm sorry, that question was for Efe. Okay, the position by a stage is that if, if you continue to do the same thing and expect different results, that would be insanity. Like you stated and has been stated um, time and again, one, it, it begs the question, we've had issues, we've had killings, why have we not stopped it from going on. I do not see the urgency on the part of the government, I, I'm sorry to say. It is not existing. It's not in existence right now. When the urgency exists, it would show from the actions of Mr. President because he will break down the service chiefs. He will demand action from them. The only reason Mr. President would accept what is going on now, from my perspective, is that he's not getting the proper representation of the facts as they are on the ground. It is possible that there are alternative facts um, if you take what has happened in the past four years from the U.S., which is just changing button now. So I do hope that the president gets the proper and requisite security information that is going on across the country for him to be able to take informed decision as to the continuous um, keeping in office or staying in office of his service chiefs. The situation we have today at hand is not encouraging whatsoever. As the commander-in-chief, he's so on oath to defend the life of every Nigerian. And for every North Carolina that is killed, from Kaduna to Bauchi to Yobe to Borono, you know, for everybody that is killed from the Kaduna, Abuja Kaduna Highway, you know, down to the border area of um, of a Niger Republic, we've had killings uh, of um, a Niger State and then Niger Republic and then Chad, you know, it it, it pushes back on the capacity of Nigeria. Hmm. It means that we do not have um, capacity to self-govern our society. So the more we allow this to fester, and if I take a little from what um, Mr. Idris just said now about the issue of um, Alaji Gumi, the cleric that has went excellent efforts by an individual, by a member of the ulama, you know, trying to bring um, results. But that is the job of government. And for me, we do not allow people who are criminals to dictate terms. This is part of the problem we had when the military issue came up in Niger Delta. Mm. There were issues about appeasement, you know, and um, call them give them something, let them drop their arms. For the government, government must show capacity. You do not negotiate from a position of weakness, but a position of strength. Mm. So if you have the capacity, you know, to enforce coercion, because you should be the only uh, um, body that has the coercive forces of state. You control all of them. And anybody who says, we will not drop our weapons until you do this, it means that you've lost credibility, you've lost control. So you must regain control. Because after you have taken control, then you cannot force people to the negotiation table. They cannot say, please give us amnesty. Yeah. Because they know that if they don't give amnesty, even when Yeradua declared amnesty for the militancy, remember he gave the 60-day period a window that drop your arms, otherwise we will visit you with the wrath of the law. 
It was that period of time that you now have people turning down their weapons, so-called um, um, retired um, uh, ex-agitators, ex-militants, if you like. Whereas I did not even support that at the time because you don't negotiate with people with people from a position of weakness. You must show capacity to deliver. Why is it difficult for us to read the entirety of the Northeast and the Northwest of these so-called bandits and Boko Haram? Why is it taking us a full term has gone from President Buhari? President Jonathan was there. It was only during his last few weeks or months of being in office that he was able to deal some serious blow to Boko Haram mm. because the election was, was at hand. President Buhari has come now. One full term has gone. He's well into his second term. And we are still speaking the kind of grammar we are speaking. Our lives are being lost. So something is on me. So for me, the Northern Edans Forum are absolutely in order because their own group would have thought that, yes, they would have been in solidarity with Mr. President because he's also of the North. But they have seen that the people are dying. And they are saying, Mr. President, we've supported you in the past, but we cannot continue to support you today. Mm. If you retain your service, you are not changing them. And okay. if you leave them, then we will bless against your party, which is the APC, in 2023. I think that's a very strong message, and the APC should be worried about it. I should okay. not in-house call Mr. President, please, your action on the retaining service chief and its economic situation is going to cost us power mm. if we continue the way we are going on. Because okay. what we are doing is not going to give us any results. Okay. Uh, you just you know, spoke into my next question to Mr. Idris. Uh, Mr. Idris, discussions for you. So where do we go from here? Because, of course, um, we've, we've talked about all of the things that could be possibly done uh, and, why, and how government can you know, rise to the occasion. But the question is, will they rise to the occasion? And, and can... can this threat that has been sent by the Northern Elders to the APC pressure Mr. President to uh, rise up to the occasion, like I said earlier, and you know, wake up to his responsibilities. And maybe also this would trickle down to uh, somewhat helping to raise the morale of our soldiers. Let's not forget there had been drama 2019, 2018 um, about the soldiers' welfare, you know, being in question and them having all they need to successfully win this war against insecurity and insurgency in the Northeast. Yeah, a lot here to discuss, really. You see, for me, I, I want to quickly respond to what uh, Efe said there. What uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Gumi, you know, uh, did was self-effort, you know. It's not anything of government, really. And uh, it is just that uh, people believe that government had tried its best. Government had given all the necessary information they need to give. All the relevant stakeholders have talked, uh, you know, and then get messages to the president. And of course, nothing is happening. It is the reason why the, the, is the, the ulama, you know, led by Sheikh Ahmed Gumi, decided to make personal visits and begin to see whether, you know, they can, they can get a truce. And I'm telling you, that thing is being gotten as we speak now. Because okay. they, 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 what, there are two things that came out from that meeting. Number one, you know, they said, well, they are ready to down tools, but the, the, the next most important thing, they need to survive. Because they cannot put out their arms, and then they cannot go ahead to survive. Because their cattle has been rusted, stolen, you know, they no longer have any source of livelihood. They don't have any social basic amenity to keep on having the, their normal livelihood. They don't have schools. They don't just have nothing to, to live on. So that is why they are saying that they need the government to come in to intervene because you need to go to those bushes. You know, it took us an hour to arrive from where we stopped to get to where these bandits are. You know, before they get there, it was a, a, a bike ride. It was, a, it was these uh, machines, you know, these power bike that took people to that place. So one hour of very rough food, not motorable. So these are the kind of uh, situation this so, will live in. So, so, with, so you can begin to imagine. the situation now, can the APC, do they have what it takes to pressure Mr. President? Do the APC, no, do they no, want to, do they no, want, sorry, do you think the APC would want to lose you want to the election come 2023, uh, or rather put pressure on Mr. President to, you know, flip the script on this one and do the, ne the, the needful? Let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you that... Uh, the PDP government, I'm not holding brief for any political party here, but I do know that the PDP government, you know, led by Jonathan at that time, the, 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 the security issue worsened, bombings and all of that. But they were able to take over 17 states, sorry, 17 local governments. They were able to put down 17 local governments before APC came in. So APC was virtually able to, you know, also help to, to, to get off 
the insurgents of Boko Haram from, from seven local governments. So that was how that thing went. So you can see that the APC, they ought to have managed the present crisis we have now. Remember the, the, the Chippewa girls, the Debchi, and now we're having the Kankara uh, kidnap and all of that. And unfortunately, if you look at the melodrama, that's what I call it, of the Kankara kidnap, they were able to successfully, you know, take, take this kids back. And then they, they told us that there was no exchange of, uh, of, of, of financial benefits. Then we begin to ask, if you say that you rescued this uh, over 400 kids and then you didn't pay ransom, then why did the insurgent kidnap these kids in the first place? Mm. They couldn't have kidnapped them if they have nothing to, 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 to take back. So some of these questions are begging for answers and then nobody's ready to, to give us the relevant answers. So this is how, how, how bad the situation had become. That we see people who are supposed to protect lives and properties as the ones that are negotiating, you know, with uh, insurgents, like uh, Efe said. We saw how Musa Arado at the late was able to, you know, introduce amnesty, what the, 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 the Obasanjo government couldn't do. But Umar Musa came, he was able to, to put down well, amnesty, give them palliatives, and uh, before you know it, there was the disquiet in the Niger Delta. So well, I think similarly, this is what the, the Arewa you know, I mean, uh, I mean, the, 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 the elders are, are saying here now that, well, that, 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 that government should do what they're supposed to do. Well, but well, then, lastly, here, the, the, the Islamic cleric, the Sheikh Abu Kamamud Gumi, we, we he's, going to see the president, he's going to give the president the awards. Uh, that is what they negotiated yesterday All right. as to getting something from the president and then they'll get back to them. And they, they thank believe you, thank that you very much, Mr. Musa Idris. Thank you. Have, Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Musa Idris is the chairman of the People's Alliance Party, and he joined us live from Kaduna. If we want to go, is a security expert joining us live from Port Hagar, River State. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. We'll keep following uh, the development of this story. We'll take a short break now. And when we come back from one situation of insurgency, insecurity to another, well, the presidency tries to settle a controversy between the Ondo state government and herdsmen in the state. We'll be right back to talk about it. Stay with us.